Okay, so well, let uh, let's just start. So welcome everyone to 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 this seminar. I was just repeating, but I can say it again. Uh, we we ask people to 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 wait until the end of the presentation and drop a note in the chat for the um, for the discussion so that we are aware. So if you have a microphone, which is a which is okay, you can ask your question afterwards, no problem. If not, you can even uh, write your question in the chat, and we and we can work like that. Today, Jean Furstos will be the the moderator, so I, I let him uh, start and uh, introduce the speaker. Hi everyone, thank you for being there. Uh, yeah. Today, we're pleased to welcome Sean Cavana, which is uh, who is graduated from the Trinity College of uh, Dublin and who is uh, currently PhD student in the University College of London and the Imperial College of London under the supervision of professors David Scallon and Aaron Walsh. His work mainly focuses on modeling point defects with uh, some applications on uh, solar photovoltaics and battery materials. And today he will talk to us about the identification of ground state structures of defects in solid. Please, uh, Shen, we are listening for you. Great. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm Sean Kavanagh and I'm a graduating PhD student um, here in London. Um, I actually submitted my thesis or the first draft of my thesis on Monday this week. So um, yeah, hopefully very soon we'll be a graduated PhD student. Um, and as Sean mentioned, I am supervised by or my PhD has been supervised by Professors Aaron Walsh and David Scanlon. I'm um, split between both UCL and Imperial Imperial College in London. Um, and funnily enough, both of my professors uh, are also Irish, as am I. So uh, they like to joke that we've a bit of a Irish mafia going on, or the Irish uh, mafia in computational chemistry in London. Um, but yeah, so my research primarily uses density functional theory, so DFT to try and understand the impact and behavior of defects and disorder in solid state energy materials. So for example, solar photovoltaics and batteries, um, as was mentioned there. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today in particular is our work looking at identifying the ground state structures of defects and solids, um, where we found that in fact, the kind of standard modeling approach for defects used by many groups worldwide and kind of what has become the conventional approach um, is actually prone to missing out on the true ground state configurations of defects um, and can give actually some kind of severe inaccuracies in, in many cases. Okay. So just to give a kind of brief introduction um, of what I'm talking about here when I um, say defects and particularly, uh, in this case, we're particularly interested in point defects um, is, well, defects are atomic level impurities that are present in essentially every bulk material. And these can be interstitials, like if you can see my mouse, um, this one here in the top left, so kind of an extra atom uh, in the uh, crystal structure. Um, you can have substitutions, shown by this pink one here, um, vacancies where we have a missing atom in our structure, um, or kind of defect complexes, such as Frenkel pairs, where you have a vacancy plus an interstitial or a Schottky pair, which is a, a pair of, um, of vacancies. Um, and excuse as well as... me to, to interrupt you. We see yeah. the mouse, but it's not okay. at the right place. It's, uh, oh, it might be the way, it, yeah. It, so I think it's because attention if you want to show okay. something that we may, we may miss, excuse me. Yeah, as usual. Um, just does this work better as the laser pointer? Like is this pointing at the right place now, if I, the pink atom? Yes, absolutely. That, okay, that's perfect. Good. Great, source it. Perfect. Um, thanks for letting me know. So yeah, and, and as well as these point defects, we can also have extended defects such as twin and grain boundaries, etc. Um, but in this case, we're focusing on the behavior of point defects, which occur at a single atomic position or point within our uh, crystalline material. Um, so the presence of these defects in materials, whether unintentionally or intentionally, which is the case where we'd call them dopants, um, can drastically affect the overall properties of the material, such as things like ionic or electronic conductivity, catalytic activity, material stability, degradation, um, solar cell efficiency, which is, which is one case that I'm particularly interested in, and thermoelectric efficiency, etc. 
Um, and in fact, it's often said that defects in some form or another uh, govern the performance properties of most functional materials. Um, so although defects in stable materials always have a positive formation enthalpy, so H here on our energy diagram, um, meaning that they cost energy to form, they still always exist in some finite concentration. Um, and this is because of the entropy contribution that they introduce, so the TS um, here. So we can understand this by considering that when we form a defect in our material, so this vacancy, for example, um, there are many potential equivalent lattice sites on which that defect can be placed. So that vacancy could be here or somewhere else in the material over here or here. And so this um, introduces a strong configurational entropy contribution to defect formation. And so at a certain equilibrium point, this um, entropic contribution counteracts the enthalpic cost of forming the defect um, where at which point the Gibbs free energy is minimized um, and yields a non-zero con equilibrium concentration of defects, um, which if you work out the maths is given by this uh, equation here. Okay. So an important point to note here when we look at our defect concentration equation is that we have this exponential dependence on the formation enthalpy uh, delta H. And so this means that um, our predicted defect concentration is actually extremely sensitive to our predicted formation energy for this defect. Um, and this is shown pretty nicely in this graph here on the left, um, where the shaded areas show the potential error or deviation in the predicted defect concentration um, for a certain error in the formation energy. So even relatively small error values of around 0.2 to 0.5 EV um, show or give concentrations that can vary by several orders of magnitude, um, and which of course would cause significant variations in the predicted impact or behavior of those defects. Um, so it's really important to get that accurate formation energies when predicting the behavior of defects to then predict how um, their concentrations in the material and how this will affect properties. So one other introductory slide, just it's quite important um, relevant to this work, is that often when analyzing the thermodynamic behavior of defects and solids, we typically use these so-called defect formation energy diagrams, um, or sometimes also called defect transition level diagrams. Um, and they give us quite a lot of information at once. So here we plot the formation energies of defects in their various charge states in the material against the Fermi level in the band gap of the material, assuming that it's a semiconducting or insulating compound. Um, so here we set you know, zero to our valence band maximum. And normally we just show the lowest energy, i.e. the most favorable charge state for each value of the Fermi level, which is uh, the shaded green line here. Um, so the lowest energy charge state at each Fermi level in the material. Um, and this kind of simplifies these diagrams, particularly when considering multiple defect species at once. Um, so we can see that for charged defects or a positively charged defect here or a negatively charged defect here, um, their formation energy uh, depends on the Fermi level in the material, which reflects the fact that the um, Fermi level is representing our electronic reservoir in the material. So the uh, probability of uh, electronic states of the defect being filled or empty. Um, and so a higher Fermi level position will favor more negatively charged defects or where those defect electronic states are being occupied um, and a lower Fermi level will favor more positively charged defects. Um, so one of the main results we take from these plots is uh, these transition points here where the equilibrium charge state of the defect changes um, from one charge to another. And these are called the defect transition levels or kind of for short, the defect levels um, or defect ionization levels sometimes. And often we plot these in vertical energy level diagrams like this. So where this point here would correspond to this level and this transition point here corresponds to this um, level. So these defect levels tell us a lot about the expected behavior of the defects in the system. For example, if they arise uh, close to the middle of the band gap, then we call them deep defects and expect them to be able to trap electrons and holes at the defect site. Um, whereas if they occur near the band edges um, in our material, then we typically call them shallow and expect them to be easily ionized, uh, contributing to doping and electronic conductivity in the material. Okay, 
So with that, um, how do we typically go about calculating defects in solids? Well, by far the most common approach in our field is the so-called supercell approach. So here we first start with the relaxed crystal structure of our host material in which we want to calculate the defects. Um, we then generate a supercell of this crystal, which should be large enough to avoid significant defect-defect uh, interactions in neighboring supercells. With this supercell as our base, we can then go on to generate the different types of defects that we want to calculate. So for example, here we can make a vacancy by simply just removing one of the red atoms. Um, another type of defect we can have is if we instead swap uh, the, these two atomic positions like this, which would be like a substitution uh, defect or a substitutional pair. Um, another type of defect, as we saw earlier, is an interstitial, in which case we just add an extra electron here um, and so on. So now with this uh, generated initial defect structure, we then allow the uh, structure to relax using um, DFT in our case, but any other total energy uh, electronic structure method can also be used. Um, and this gives us our final defect structure. Um, and lastly, with this relaxed defect structure, we can calculate the formation energy. Um, and this is essentially involves taking the difference in energy between our relaxed defect structure and the initial pristine uh, or defect-free bulk supercell, uh, as well as accounting for some finite size effects, particularly if our defect is charged, where we have some Coulomb effects to, to cancel out, um, and the chemical potential corrections, which account for the fact that we may have changed the number of uh, atoms or elements in our material in creating the defect. So for example, in a vacancy by removing that um, atom accounting for the chemical potential reservoir um, that acts as our reference. Um, okay, so from these calculations, we can then derive essentially all properties associated with the defect um, in the material. So including its concentration, the ionization level, the deeper shallow behavior that was mentioned earlier, and the predicted doping behavior of the defect, um, maybe electron hole recombination, diffusion, uh, et cetera. So essentially from the final defect structure, we derive all properties associated with the defect. Okay, so what's wrong with this approach? I mean, it all seems relatively straightforward, right? Um, well, I'll tell a short story about when I was a young and fresh-faced first-year PhD student. Um, I started doing defect calculations in cadmium telluride, which is a um, quite a technologically relevant uh, semiconductor for solar cell, um, for photovoltaic solar cells. It's the second largest market for uh, photovoltaic solar cells behind silicon. Um, and the idea of my PhD initially was to try and apply some of our state-of-the-art defect characterization methods um, to see if we could resolve some long-standing mysteries in this material. Um, so I read the papers, I followed this workflow I've just described, um, and calculated kind of my nice set of defect results, which I was pretty happy with. Um, I then started reading some older defect theory papers um, on cadmium telluride, and initially I was quite happy. My results uh, are shown here, which predict these two shallow or near the valence band maximum transition levels for cadmium vacancies in cadmium telluride, and um, matched quite well with some of these older theoretical papers um, for this material. But then I read some papers by uh, Lani and Zunger from the early 2000s, where they had found these metal-metal dimer reconstructions at vacancies in similar materials. So in some of these other 2,6 uh, semiconductors. And I wondered if this would be possible in my system. Um, so I took the two atoms beside my vacancy like this and forced them closer together before then uh, relaxing from this initial distorted structure. And then what I found was that this actually relaxed to a different defect structure than the one I had originally calculated, which was actually significantly lower in energy. Um, so this was quite surprising. I then went and kind of reassessed or looked at some of the other defects I had calculated um, and kind of looking by looking at some of the structure motifs and seeing if it would be likely to show similar reconstructions in some of those cases, again, maybe forming some of these dimer type species or something else, um, and messed around a bit with manually displacing some of these atoms before performing the relaxations. 
And in a couple of other cases, again, I found um, that actually by initially distorting these structures and then relaxing, I was getting some lower energy defects. Um, okay, let's see here. So looking at my transition level diagram or defect formation energy diagram I showed there, this dimer formation actually has quite a significant impact on the uh, defect level picture. So going from having these two shallow levels near the valence band maximum to now having a single deep negative U level, meaning it transitions directly from zero to minus two charge state um, with the minus one charge state actually always being uh, thermodynamically unstable. Um, and also qualitatively alters the electron hole recombination behavior of this defect as well, as you'll, um, as you'll see later. Uh, and in many cases, the change in behavior upon some of these defect reconstructions is actually even more drastic than this. So the problem I'm talking about here, of course, is that when we generate our initial defect structure in this way, as I kind of just described um, before relaxing via some gradient based optimizer, as is done in essentially all ab initio defect studies, there's no guarantee that this will actually give us our true ground state defect structure. For example, this ideal undistorted defect structure could actually lie much closer to a local minimum on our potential energy surface, as was the case here, which would then give us a higher energy metastable structure, which does not reflect the true defect behavior. Um, so even though this is actually a more subtle change than what we see in many other cases, you can still see that here we have an energy difference of around half an electron volt, um, which if you remember from those earlier slides I showed with the defect concentrations and their dependence on your predicted formation energy would actually correspond to a couple of orders of magnitude difference in our predicted concentration of this vacancy. Um, so for a long while, this problem has been essentially ignored within the defects community with uh, people assuming that our standard approach was giving us the correct defect. Um, the main reasons behind this were firstly that, well, we didn't really know how prevalent this behavior could be for defects in solids, um, which is mainly because, well, we didn't go looking for it. You know, if you, if you create your defect and perform the relaxation from there, you can only get one answer, which is yet yeah, the result of that relaxation. Um, and so you won't actually really notice or find this behavior unless you actually go out looking for it. Um, and also because, well, we didn't really have any established methods to try and identify this behavior or to try and go look for it. So we didn't really know where to start. Um, okay. So, of course, this isn't just an issue for defects, um, but can be an issue for bulk crystal structure optimization as well. Um, however, typically it's less of an issue in that case, um, as we have experimental databases, which provide us with a good initial guess of the material structure from X-ray diffraction measurements, for example, um, which typically puts us quite close to the true global minimum on our potential energy surface when then performing these uh, structure relaxations. For unknown crystal structure prediction, however, this is actually quite a huge avenue of research um, and there's been a lot of work done in that space. Um, however, for defects, people assumed that it wasn't really an issue as you know we know the bulk crystal structure, so we can just create the defect from there and relax. Um, but in fact, defects themselves are unknown, uh, unknown structures and we don't have any database of known defect structures. And so we can often end up with this behavior um, for defects as well, where we're initially sitting closer to a local minimum rather than the actual global minimum on our potential energy surface. Okay, so the question we wanted to answer in our study was um, firstly, how prevalent is this behavior? So we tested this by applying our recently developed structure searching method to a wide and diverse range of materials and their defects listed here. Um, so going from kind of elemental um, covalent semiconductors like silicon, and some of these um, ionic covalent uh, semiconducting compounds, cadmium telluride, antimony sulfide, uh, as well as um, more ionic uh, compounds like these oxides um, here. Um, and we found this behavior to occur for defects in every material we looked at, where you get energy lowering reconstructions for certain defects that are missed by the standard defect modeling procedure I just described. Um, and there's a variety of underlying physical driving factors that can cause this behavior. Um, so one is dimerization, which is the kind of example I mentioned previously, where there's initially a barrier to two atoms moving closer together, but then once you overcome that barrier, it actually becomes much lower energy as they form this strong 
dimer bond. Um, sometimes you can have cation anion rebonding, which is where you have some sort of displacement of the ions to kind of favor or produce more cation anion bonds and reduce the number of cation cation or anion anion bonds. Um, particularly in some of the oxides, you can often have crystal field splitting or Jan Teller electronic effects driving this. Um, or in other cases, it's more kind of just um, electrostatics, that there's some sort of rearrangement of the ions that lowers the electrostatic energy of your system that also drives this reconstruction behavior. Okay. So after answering that question, um, the next question we might ask is, well, how important can this behavior be? Well, if we remind ourselves of the fact that the defect structure gives us all the properties associated with the defect, um, we can see that an inaccurate structure will give an inaccurate formation energy and thus inaccurate derived properties. Um, for example, this diagram here um, kind of shows how even relatively minor changes in our predicted defect formation energy here um, can lead to quite significant changes in the predicted defect level or transition level position within our band gap um, and thus on the predicted doping and recombination behavior of our defect, uh, similar to what we saw with the earlier cadmium vacancy example. Um, one quite severe example, which had not been previously realized in the literature, is the vacancies in antimony selenide and antimony sulfide, um, which are uh, quite um, receiving a lot of research attention at the moment as potential earth abundant solar photovoltaic materials. So here our method identifies these strong antimony antimony and sulfur sulfur dimers uh, forming in this at the vacancies in this material, um, which dramatically lowers the defect energies as shown in the plot on the left here, um, making them much more important defects in this material in these materials. For example, the uh, difference in the predicted concentrations on the typical annealing conditions for this material uh, corresponding to this difference in energy actually corresponds to a difference of 21 orders of magnitude in the predicted concentrations. So basically going from entirely negligible to now being a dominant defect in this system. It also reveals this uh, quite extremely rare four electron negative U behavior that we see for the uh, selenium vacancies here, where the equally been charged state directly changes all the way from plus two to minus two um, at this one point in the Fermi level. Um, and this leads to quite strong what we call self-compensation behavior and um, preventing significant doping or tuning of the Fermi level in this material um, as is witnessed experimentally. Okay, um, so this is a kind of another point to briefly show, um, which I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, but that independent of the changes in formation energies that these uh, reconstructions can cause, um, Another point is that the changes in the atomic structure from identifying these reconstructions um, can also be quite important to the predicted recombination behavior. Um, so as kind of shown in these diagrams here, um, the defect structures identified through these symmetry breaking reconstructions can sometimes open new pathways for electron hole recombination to occur in the material. Um, and can transform, in some cases, a benign defect species, which doesn't facilitate fast electron hole recombination into suddenly being what we'd call a killer defect in our um, system, where it facilitates these fast electron hole recombination pathways, essentially acting like a catalytic intermediate in this process. Mm -hmm. um, and so this can be really important to the efficiency of either solar cell materials, um, or for emission applications, so LEDs, for example. Okay. Um, so listed here are some further examples of uh, where this behavior has been noted, either serendipitously or through manual searching, and found to be crucial for the defect properties, again, demonstrating the widespread prevalence and importance of these reconstructions for solids. Um, I would also mention here that a key observation from our studies and from surveying the literature is that often these defects which can undergo energy lowering reconstructions um, are actually the ones that end up dictating the impact of defects in the material as these distortions can dramatically lower their formation energy and often result in them becoming one of the dominant high concentration defect species in the material as a result, as we saw in that previous slide. Okay, so now we've established the importance and the prevalence of this behavior, what can we do to combat it? 
Well, there have been a handful of strategies proposed in the literature, which I don't really have time to discuss in too much um, detail here, beyond saying that their inefficiency, both computationally and in terms of user implementation and hyperparameter tuning, um, generally makes them infeasible for typical defect studies where we want to look at a range of potential defects at once. Um, so some of them can be quite powerful if you're looking at a single um, point defect species and have quite a lot of computational power to burn, um, but generally are too inefficient to really be applied in most cases. So with that in mind, um, we had the goal of developing a method that was both accurate and efficient in navigating the defect configurational landscape and identifying the ground state structures. Um, so I had the idea to try and leverage the so-called uh, localized molecule in a solid type behavior of point defects, where the significant interactions are mainly those with the nearest and second nearest neighbors, as well as the fact that defect reconstructions are typically driven by the need to accommodate the excess charge introduced by that defect species. So what I mean by this, for example, is that um, in something like cadmium telluride, where cadmium is in the plus two oxidation state and tellurium is in the minus two oxidation state, um, if we create a cadmium vacancy, so by pulling out an ionized or a cadmium ion, um, that vacancy will be in the minus two charge state, so relative to what um, the charge of that uh, lattice site beforehand. Um, in the neutral state of this defect, however, we now have two excess holes present um, at that defect site. And so often this will lead to some sort of reconstruction involvement movement of two of the defect neighbors um, to accommodate this charge, which is what we saw in that earlier case for the tellurium tellurium dimerization, um, where those two tellurium atoms come closer together and form that dimer bond, and tra just essentially trapping or stabilizing that excess charge. Um, so in our method, we apply a range of distortions to the defect neighbor atoms using this value of the excess charge to dictate the number of bonds to distort. Um, so this isn't always perfect, but it typically gives us a good starting point and puts, or pushes us close enough to the local to the global minimum that a gradient optimization will find it if present. Um, and we've tested this choice across a range of cases with the data provided in the SI of our paper. Um, so with this mesh of trial distorted structures, we then rattle these structures, meaning that we add some small random displacements to the structure to break symmetry and try and aid the location of the global minimum by our gradient based uh, optimizer. So we then take these kind of mesh of trial distorted and rattled structures and relax them at a reliable level of theory, but using cheap coarse numerical parameters, which make the calculations run fast while retaining sufficient qualitative accuracy to identify distinct defect structures um, on the potential energy surface as shown here. So finally, if we take the uh, energies of these relaxations and plot them against their uh, distortion factor, we can see that um, in a certain distortion range, our defect ground state is obtained um, corresponding to these points on our potential energy surface shown here. So in summary, the strategy here is to use a coarse exploration of the potential energy surface to identify the ground state structure before continuing with the final converged energy calculations with our uh, correct structure. So we found this method to be um, kind of surprisingly successful in identifying structural reconstructions at defects, reproducing all known cases of this behavior in our benchmark data set. Um, by then applying it to a kind of even further wide and diverse range of materials, we revealed the widespread prevalence of this behavior um, as well as the underlying driving factors, identifying these reconstructions in many cases which had not been previously uh, realized. Um, some key points maybe to mention about the code implementation are that it is quite efficient, coming to around 10% additional uh, total computational cost of a typical full defect study. Um, and is also automated and user friendly, uh, as well as trivially parallel, meaning you can run all these structure searching calculations at once if you have the compute power available and don't need to wait for the results of one calculation to, um, to finish to, before starting the next. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, as a brief sneak preview, I just wanted to mention our recent collaboration with Professor Yu Kumigai in Japan, um, where we were applying our shake and break method in a high throughput search for symmetry breaking at oxygen vacancies in several hundred oxides. Um, so in this case, uh, Professor Kumagai had recently published a data set on performing some high throughput calculations on up to 900 oxide materials and um, looking at oxygen vacancies. Um, and we wanted to apply our method to this data set and see um, as a kind of a nice way of testing the prevalence of this behavior in oxide materials. Um, so we identified energy loan reconstructions in over 50% of these vacancies. Um, and note that this tends to be particularly common in cases of multinary composition, um, reduced crystal symmetry, and mixed ionic covalent bonding in the material, as all of these contribute to greater complexity in the potential energy surface, and thus much more likelihood um, for having these metastable local minima on your potential energy surface. Um, so I guess this is kind of essentially what I've just said, but um, from our initial studies using this method, these are our main findings in terms of the indicators of this uh, reconstruction behavior or metastability on the defect potential energy surface. Um, so this multinary composition, reduced crystal symmetry. Also, if you have, um, I guess, what you call a space to distort or a relatively open crystal structure, particularly um, favors this behavior. Um, or potentially a dynamic structure, such as in the halide perovskites, where there's quite a lot of um, octahedral tilting. Um, and all of this can contribute to a more complex potential energy surface, and thus a greater likelihood of this behavior. Okay. Um, okay. The final point uh, to mention before I wrap up, um, something we were curious about when we saw how surprisingly well our method performed for identifying these reconstructions for uh, point defects was to see if we could apply it to the kind of conceptually similar problem of identifying polar on or self-trapped exciton structures in solids, um, where again, we have it's this form of localized impurity within a delocalized bulk solid, um, and so quite a conceptually similar problem. Um, and again, where there's been quite a few attempts in the literature to develop strategies to locate these configurations. Um, a particularly interesting case was uh, for this self-trapped exciton in the family of A4MX6 compounds, which are a form of vacancy-ordered perovskite compound, um, as these had been shown uh, to have a high thermal sensitivity in the self-trapped exciton lifetimes, um, and which has actually been recently used to, demonstrate, to develop a highly sensitive um, spatial and thermal resolution uh, thermographic devices. Um, so it's essentially very accurately measuring the temperature of a specific point in space, um, which has a lot of powerful applications in you know, medicine or uh, space, for example. So previous calculations for these self-trapped exitons had predicted this tetragonally contracted octahedral structure for the self-trapped exciton in these materials, which is the structure you obtain when you um, employ gradient optimization from the initial bulk octahedral structure. However, with shake and break, we actually find that there's this lower energy octahedral motif where you instead get a tetragonal expansion of the octahedron uh, and it's around 0.4, um, there should be units on that, but 0.4 EV lower in energy um, for both the lead or tin based uh, analog of this material. Um, so does this difference actually matter though? Um, well, yes, it appears to help explain the sensitive temperature dependence of our exciton lifetime in this material. Um, because our initial unperturbed octahedral structure is within this um, energy well here uh, of the contracted self-trapped uh, uh, exciton state. And so upon exciton trapping, it's expected that we initially adopt this metastable configuration. Then with thermal energy, we expect it to overcome this kinetic barrier to the lower energy expanded octahedron structure that we've now identified depopulating our emissive exciton state uh, that the, the sensor wavelength is fixed to. And so the relatively small energy barrier, but significant energy difference between these two states uh, yields this close temperature sensitivity. Okay. Um, 
So the key takeaway from this sort of whistle stop tour of this work is that symmetry breaking and energy lowering reconstructions are prevalent across defects in essentially all solid materials, and that this behavior is crucial to obtaining accurate predictions of defect properties. Um, this is particularly relevant for materials uh, such as perovskites, um, where you have things like multinary composition, reduced crystal symmetry, open crystal structures, uh, maybe mixed ionic covalent bonding, and or dynamic crystal structure, um, which all contribute to this uh, behavior. Um, though again, we've also seen this uh, in, in, a, in materials which don't have any of these factors, such as silicon, um, where you have this pure covalent structure, but this uh, behavior still persists. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up, um, particularly give acknowledgements to the people involved. Um, so Araya Mascara Louise was the uh, master student I was supervising on this project um, when it first began, who is now a PhD student in Professor Aaron Walsh's group, um, and she's absolutely one to watch for the future. Um, and the project would just simply would not have been successful without her. Um, of course, my professors, David Scanlon and Aaron Walsh, um, and here are the links to the code documentation where you can find out more if you're interested. Um, it's compatible with quite a range of computational material science codes. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention.